Welcome back to the Product Alignment Podcast. Today, I'm excited to delve into the concept of blitz scaling with my guest, Chris Ye. Blitz scaling is a counterintuitive approach to scaling up the startup quickly by prioritizing speed over efficiency. This strategy is geared towards startups operating in a winner-take-all market where achieving scale rapidly is key to unlocking competitive advantage. In our discussion, Chris shares insights from his best-selling book, Blitzscaling, that he co-authored with LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman. He explains what Blitzscaling is, how it works, and some of the key transitions startups need to make, like going from being a pirate to a Navy. If you're a startup founder or a spine entrepreneur who is rapidly scaling a business, this segment offers an intriguing playbook for Blitzscaling success. I hope you enjoy our conversation, Unlocking the Bold Mindset, and counterintuitive rules for hyper growth with Chris Ye. Now on to blitz scaling. What is happening right now in technology and the application of, of how you have to think about building a business today is completely changed from my experience. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as the landscape today and how that's evolved from, from where tech started you know, 20 years ago? Yeah, it's amazing. It's hard for people who didn't grow up and go through this era to understand it. But once upon a time, technology was a small sector off in the corner of the economy. And people didn't really talk about it that much. When the dot-com boom happened in the mid-1990s, that was the thing that started moving tech into the mainstream. And it moved into the mainstream very quickly. Everyone started talking about dot-com companies. People started making fun of it on late-night television. But then the dot-com crash came in 2000, 2001, and everyone said, oh, well, we're going back to the old way. Turns out that the seeds had been laid, and we were never going back to the old way. And since that crash, technology has become more and more important until it's really part of everyone's lives today. And that's because of the internet, which is how we do so much of our work and how we live so much of our lives. But it's also because of the fact that Apple and the iPhone and then related all the other additional smartphones from that, primarily based on Google's Android, became ubiquitous in our lives. And now it's impossible to think about our lives without technology. Uh, about a decade plus ago, Mark Andreessen, the very famous venture capitalist who got his fame as the founder of Netscape so long ago, said that software was eating the world. And you know, now if he published that essay, he'd have to change the title. Instead of software is eating the world, it's software has eaten the world. And technology is everywhere, and every company is now a technology company. You know, it's so true. I think you know, as the technology has consumed the world, it's also amazing how it started to change the way that we live and work in that world. And so, yeah. you know, big part of you know the area that I'm always very interested in and in, in looking at is how the psychology of running a business, how you have to act as a leader and how you have to think about the foundational elements of building great products that you know are the fuel for these organizations is ha has just so dramatically changed um, which i think is a perfect segue into the book that you co-authored with reed hoffman blitz scaling um, can you share a little bit about that book and why you felt that book was so important to write absolutely so reed and i wrote blitz scaling which we published in 2018 because we observed that companies seem to be getting bigger, faster than ever before. So whether it was the sudden profusion of unicorn startups or the fact that a company like Facebook in which Reed was the first outside investor had gone from a dorm room to the biggest website in the world in less than a decade, things were just happening fast. I mean, once upon a time, if you went to General Motors or Ford, it took you a couple of decades to become the world's biggest company. Now all of a sudden it was taking less than 10 years. And the question was why? And that's what we set out to examine in blitz scaling. We looked at all these different examples. We actually taught a class at Stanford so we could call in many of the world's most famous CEOs, people like Eric Schmidt of Google, Reed Hastings of Netflix, folks like Brian Chesky of Airbnb, who was much less well known then. And we asked them about you know, what were the things that were going on as they were building their companies. And that's where the story of blitz scaling comes from. Now, what we define blitz scaling as is the prioritization of speed over efficiency in the face of uncertainty. And it's a strategy you follow if you are in a valuable winner take most market, where if you're the first to achieve a certain critical scale, you will trigger competitive advantages that will allow you to then dominate that market for decades and print money along the way. 
So that's the dynamic behind blitzscaling. And what we try to do, because it's so counterintuitive, is just to explain, okay, where did this come from? How does it work? And how do you know whether your company should be blitzscaling or not? You know, I remember when the book first came out, and I, it's a, anybody needs to be reading it if they're in technology or they're thinking yeah. about going through a digital transformation of a traditional company. I, I think one of the things that really stands out, though, is how much traditional thinking is still pervasive in technology companies, even if it's from their genesis. And as you said, there's a lot of counterintuitive aspects to blitzscaling around, you know, really looking at, um, you know, prioritizing that scale and growth over that efficiency. Could you highlight a few other examples around kind of what, you know, is breaks the status quo? What has changed the norm compared to how a lot of people have looked at businesses traditionally and, and why that's so important? Yeah. So the way we think about the world is the way we think about business. We try to simplify. We try to have a relatively static view of the world because that's what allows us to stop and analyze and explain it. And that's fine for certain types of businesses. It typically hasn't worked for new emerging industries. This has always been the case, whether it's the railroad industry, the steamship industry, you name it. Those industries are dynamic and changing very rapidly. And we don't see the previous generation of incumbents managing to handle that transition. And that's been true without you know, high tech. Just That was just tech. That was just mechanical engineering. But the thing that you have to do when it comes to blitzscaling is to say, okay, we are in a period of change, not a period of stasis. And things are going to be changing continuously for some period of time. And that completely changes the way you manage. In a world where things are static, it makes sense to manage for efficiency because you're going to be rewarded for your ability to wring out additional efficiency to be able to squeeze out more revenues and more profits out of an existing business, which is going to change incrementally. But when you are in a world where technology is changing everything and everything is changing at an incredibly rapid rate, trying to optimize is foolish. Instead, you should be focused on changing as quickly as possible, achieving speed to be able to adapt to the new circumstances. And that's what triggers blitzscaling. Usually it's a technological change like the arrival of the web browser or the release of the iPhone that then throws everything up for grabs. And under those circumstances, instead of trying to find the most efficient way to build a smartphone, even if it takes a couple of extra years, the goal should be to find the fastest way to build a smartphone because whoever gets that out into the market first is going to have a major advantage. Oh, I absolutely love hearing you describe that. So one thing that I run into a lot when I'm talking to founders and, and product leaders about this is that they're oftentimes still clamoring to certainty. And you're mm. talking about adaptability and really, you know, driving into the heart of innovation and, you know, at least how I see it. And I think that, that it's really what I'm hearing is, is, is partly that, you know, that certainty has, you have to let go. You have to be vulnerable. Yeah. You have to be willing to fail and be wrong. Um, I mean, you actually wrote a great uh, blog post um, late last year about failure, accepting the rate of failure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're starting a business and what that looks like. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on a little bit more of embracing that failure, because it's counterintuitive for a leader who's being asked to make some quick decisions, thinks that they have to provide certainty to their teams, uh, whether certainty to their to maybe investors or their customers, and yet they're constantly needing to be adaptive and to evolve. And so what does that look like from your perspective when you're working with individuals? What kind of dynamics or challenges have you experienced? Yeah, this is one of the most challenging things about being an entrepreneur, which is that you have to go against all of your instincts and all of your years of schooling and training. If you think about how the educational system works, what happens is we're told that there is a right answer and we are rewarded for providing that right answer. And in fact, we're graded on a percentage basis. And the goal is to be right over 90% of the time. Okay, you can only be right 90% of the time in a static world where things have stabilized to the point where there is that right answer. 
And so we develop all these muscles around optimization and efficiency and getting things right 90% of the time. Well, when you are dealing with a new technology, a new industry, you're trying to create a new company, there's no way you could be right 90% of the time. In fact, the off-sided statistic is if you look at venture-backed companies, maybe 10% of them are going to be successful in the sense of generating returns well in excess of what was invested into them. And the other 90%, 60% are just going to outright fail and the rest are going to just sort of bump along as zombie companies until they're finally acquired for a relative pittance. And so as a result, you have to completely adjust your mindset. Your mindset cannot be, I'm going to do what's comfortable, I'm going to do what's familiar, and I'm going to do what's certain. Because doing that is guaranteed failure. Because somebody else is going to take risks, they're going to win that market, they're going to dominate that market, and it doesn't matter what you did or how safe you felt, you're going to lose. And distinguishing between the illusion of certainty and safety and the reality of the fact that there is no certainty and there is no guaranteed safety is the thing that entrepreneurs have to do. You have to learn to let go of these illusions, deal with the world as it actually is, and understand that there is a decent chance of failure anytime you try to do something new and innovative. You know, it reminds me, there's of course that, that saying of fail fast and fail often. How often is that also misunderstood? Should that be dangerous for somebody is taking that leap yeah. of, I'm feeling certain, oh, I just need to fail more but not actually calculating that they're adapting to something important, driving outcomes, lessons learned to continuously be iterating and evolving. Talk to me a little bit about that. How have you seen this idea yeah. of that once they do accept the idea of they, they do need to be adaptive, they do need to be willing to set their own biases aside. They're willing to embrace yeah. change where they stumble. Yeah. And this is one of the big things. I mean, there's this fetishization of failure. There's nothing about a failure that's inherently noble. It is a risk we run in order to do something new and innovative. Failure does not necessarily make us any better than people who succeed. Of course, everyone should succeed if they can. But failure is this inevitable byproduct of trying something new. And the key is to learn from those failures as well. As we are trying to win at a new game, what we have to do is we have to both try to win the game, but also try to figure out the rules of the new game, right? If we imagine if we were playing chess and we had no idea what the rules are, it's going to be very hard to win. And so you experiment, you try things and you lose along the way, but you learn a little bit about the rules every time you play. And then hopefully you're able to then turn around and form a winning strategy. The difference between the analogy I just gave in the real world, however, is that in chess, the rules are going to be stable. And in the real world, the rules are never stable. And so you have to learn to let go of the certainty and just continue to learn and unlearn, learn and unlearn in order to actually find your way to victory. I love that. That's a perfect segue into the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is you talk about these key transitions in blitz scaling that organizations need to go through. And then that leads into these counterintuitive rules that you've found. Can you talk a little bit first about what those transitions are? And then I want to dig into a couple of those counterintuitive points that I think are really surprising and definitely, you know, are bucking the norm of what people are talking about. And I think they don't understand quite right. Absolutely. So the thing about the key transitions is it's really the key transitions that companies go through as they scale and mature. And the reason it's so important for blitz scalers to understand these key transitions is because the pace of change is so much faster in a blitz scaling company. In a traditional, relatively slow growth company, it's going to go through those same key transitions. But that process of going through those key transitions might take 50 years. And in a blitz scaling company, it might take five. And in a 50 year process, it's gradual, it's incremental, and you don't have to think about it too much. You just make little tiny changes along the way. In a blitz scaling company where you have to go through massive change multiple times over the course of five years, you can't just feel your way 
to that kind of transition. You have to think about it explicitly and try to move quickly. And so when we talk about key transitions, whether it's from generalists to specialists or from pirate to Navy, the real problem is not the transition because every company has to go through those transitions. It's how do you go through those transitions at hyperspeed? I love that. Now you said we're transitioning from pirate to Navy. I feel like we would be doing a disservice if we didn't unpack that one a little bit before we went forward, because I think that might be a little bit hard for those who haven't read the book. Um, do you mind expanding on what that means in the context of blitzscaling? Absolutely. So the thing about pirates, and again, I want to emphasize we're talking about sort of Pirates of the Caribbean style pirates, so not necessarily sociopathic killers, but you know more the lovable rogues, the risk takers. The thing about a pirate is that pirates were risk takers and they were flexible and they were not as bound by rules as a traditional Navy. And that's what allowed them to be successful, the feeling that they had nothing to lose and the willingness to try things that a naval officer would not. And that's what makes a startup special. Startups, if they try to compete and play the same game as an established player, they're going to lose because the established company has more people, more resources, more branding, more everything. And so you have to play a different game. You have to take on bigger risks that your competitors are unwilling to take. So that's where the piracy comes in. But that behavior, while it makes sense when you have nothing to lose, doesn't make sense when you have a lot to lose. So if you're successful at blitzscaling, you're going to grow pretty fast. And pretty soon you'll find yourself in a situation where you have a ton to lose. And where as you get bigger and bigger, it becomes harder and harder to take on the world with the same kind of flexibility and devil-may-care attitude. And so every blitzscaler, as they grow, have to transition from being a pirate to being more of a Navy admiral, really thinking about how do we manage an entire fleet of ships with a variety of different captains and a variety of different missions. And so that's why the pirate and Navy transition is so important. You succeed early on by being a pirate, but the founder has to transition to being an admiral or you have to bring in grown up leadership. Otherwise the company is not gonna be properly run. Yeah, I love that. What a, what a great analogy. Um, when One of the key things that we didn't get to get into when you're visiting Portland that I've been dying to ask you about mm. this is that is the counterintuitive rule of ignoring your customer. I mean, everywhere you where everyone's talking about customer experience, customer first, how this has to be, you know, the driver of everything that you do. And even from that perspective, many organizations are still deeply struggling with really tapping into a true customer user centric approach to how they develop product and empowering teams to deliver that product based on where value is created for those users. And there's always a trade off going on. So I really wanted to get your take on when you say ignoring your customer, what does that mean when you're blitz scaling? So this is one of those things that we put out there. It's deliberately provocative, but it is a relatively famous story. So in the early days of PayPal, when the company had hit its stride and achieved product market fit, it was growing very rapidly. It was growing at um, somewhere around five to 10% a day. Now that is an incredible growth rate. And that's why the company became so valuable so quickly. But PayPal is a software business. Software has bugs. And so there were bugs and there were things that were going wrong along the way, even as the company is growing. Now, the thing about a payment system is that if you are talking about, oh, I'm playing Tetris and my game crashed, you're like, damn it, I was just about to get that four long piece and, and really knock out some rows. I'm pissed off, but I'm just going to start up the game and play again. Not that big a deal. If you are a payment network and somebody says, hey, I sent you the money and you're like, hey, I didn't get the money. Guess what? You care a lot. And that was what was happening with PayPal. People were sending money and it wasn't getting through. And guess what? People get really irritated under those circumstances. So the customers began to really clamor for help. And it turns out that they could only clamor in certain ways. They could write an email and there were two people on the team who answered those emails. The only problem was that the number of emails coming in was about 150 a day and the people answering the emails could answer about 50 a day. So the number of customer service requests was piling up and getting bigger every single day. And it got to the point where it was so bad 
that those customers would look up PayPal in the white pages, which is a, an old fashioned physical phone book that you could use to get information on companies. This really did exist once upon a time. And they would call the number. Of course, there was nobody at the front desk. It was just a voicemail system. You know, press one if you know the party's extension you're trying to reach. And so people would say, well, shoot, I need my money. And they would just start pressing numbers at random until they got someone. And once they got to them, they started yelling and saying, where's my money? And so this was happening often enough such that every phone in the office phone system was ringing constantly. And if you picked up the phone, it was an angry customer. Wow. Now, what do you do about that situation? That's a pretty crazy situation. And there are a variety of ways you could address that. You could redirect your resources to customer service, try to get ahead of the problem. You could direct more of your resources to bug fixing, try to get ahead of the problem that way. You could even do something radical like throttling the new accounts because the new accounts were more likely to run to problems. The older accounts would figure out a way around it. All of those things are things you could do, but they would all result in your slowing the company down. And the question becomes, what is the greatest value creation mechanism for the users, for the customers? And is it perfect transactions? Or is it, in this case, because it's a payment network, the broadest possible payment network, the most people willing to accept payment, the most people sending payments. And the fact of the matter was that the most important thing to the PayPal payment network was just its breadth. And so they looked at the situation and said, well, the problems are a problem, but they only affect a tiny percentage of the users. And the rest of them are getting along just fine. And these are unfortunate problems. But we need to keep growing as quickly as possible because the most valuable thing we can do for our customers is to expand the network. And so their solution was very simple. They turned off the phone system. They turned off the ringers and they told everyone to use their cell phones if they needed to make a call. And they just ignored the customers. And you couldn't do this forever because, again, those people were angry. And eventually that could catch up with you. And so after they raised a bunch more money and they had defeated their biggest competitor, they went ahead and spent the money on customer service. They actually opened up a customer service office in Omaha, Nebraska. And today there are over 5,000 PayPal employees in Omaha, Nebraska handling customer service for the company. So I love your stories. They're, they're always, they're so great. They, they paint, a, you know, an incredible picture of how some of these companies have evolved. But one of the things that really stands out to me about that one is that in, in that kind of moment, when the pressure is on from these customers, yeah. it requires leadership to have incredible line of sight of where values create. Yes. And I've seen that that's an incredibly difficult thing to hold true in the moment when you are having to move and look at things from 10,000 feet and you're at you know, boots on the ground, you're in the trenches, you're trying to solve problems for your customers. How have you seen leaders effectively be able to navigate that? Because that is a very unique skill. And a lot of people have never been in a situation where they're pressure tested to see if they can deliver in that kind of environment where they might be blitz scaling. So this is the $64 billion question. Because as you know, from being a founder and CEO yourself, you don't really know until you're in that situation, whether or not you'll be able to manage it. Probably the most important thing is to be able to manage the emotions of the moment and be able to focus on what I call finding the underlying mechanism of action, which is a term I steal from the pharmaceutical industry. It basically means why does this drug actually work? How does this heart medication work? Well, it lowers the blood pressure and that makes it easier for the heart to pump. Oh, okay. That's good to know. So in the moment, as you have these angry customers calling in, you have to be able to manage those emotions, manage the incredible urge, just do something already, do something about it. Oh my God, all these people are angry. This is all going to go so badly and sit down and say, where does the value creation come from? What is the mechanism of action? Well, people get value from our payment network because they can send money to pay for purchases and they can accept money and run their businesses. Okay. Well, what adds to their value? Well, if you're somebody who sends money, it's more merchants who accept the payments. 
And if you're someone who collects money, it's more people who will be willing to send me payments because that's my customers. All right. So does our solution actually improve that? Does it create value or not? Well, let's see. We could put more customers on customer service, uh, more employees on customer service. Okay, that would help some. It would help the few exceptions where there's a problem. So it's helpful, but is it really that big a needle mover? Okay. Uh, what if instead we throttled new users? Oh, actually, that's bad because that prevents the merchants from having new customers. And in fact, that destroys value. We can't very well do that. Now, this is hard to do when there's people screaming at you. But if you have the emotional maturity to sort of distance yourself from that moment and ask those questions and sort of walk through the process of figuring out value creation, you'll generally find the right idea of what to do.